Hello everyone. First and foremost, I'd like to thank Mr. Gada for inviting me to this opportunity and everyone here for attending. I'd also like to especially thank IAM and its dedicated organizers for this very special event commemorating Gandhi Jayanti and the 152nd birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi. What makes this gathering here special, I believe, is that it's special and relevant and it recognizes Mahatma Gandhi's legacy specifically. The evergreen legacy of nonviolence is, was, and will always continue to be pertinent to society, to you, to me, this nation, and the world. Mahatma Gandhi lives on, not through his body anymore, but through his soul, his words, and the countless causes and people he inspired and continues to inspire to this day. So I want to use my few minutes to talk about history as it applies to our world today, the current implications of Mahatma Gandhi's legacy. Gandhi, as we all know, is considered the father of India. His philosophy of nonviolence is a religious principle of ahimsa, which means no harm to any living thing. Gandhi came up with a unique and powerful movement called Satyagraha, which is basically non-violent civil disobedience, such as not conforming or not cooperating with the British. He objects violence as it perpetuates hatred, as it equalizes the oppressor and the oppressed, as it weakens one cause, as it gives the enemy continued reason to continue to oppress, to continue to attack. He said that that kind of violence, both passive and physical, brings injury to a living person, and that is immoral. He preached ahimsa, no injury to anyone, even to your enemies. He says a person who possesses nonviolence is a blessed and brave soul. Gandhi tried to instill bravery and courage and love in every individual through his speech, his actions, and his writings. He preached fear not, hate not, hate not, for hate stirs up fear, strife, where love brings peace. Gandhi showed the world a place where the principle of nonviolence is showcased and a movement that successfully brought an entire subcontinent back to the hands of its own people. Nonviolence is no doubt the superior force. Forty years later, uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, the civil rights movement in the United States to end racial discrimination and segregation and injustice against black Americans was in full swing. The philosophical method of nonviolence in the civil rights movement was largely inspired by Gandhi's successful non-cooperating policies in India. An example of this was the famous Montgomery bus boycott. When the U.S. Supreme Court later ruled in 1956 that segregation in buses is against the Constitution, in his victory speech, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. said that Christ showed us the way, Gandhi in India showed us that it could work, end quote. The principles of nonviolence in buses being shown that it is against the Constitution of the United States and the principles of nonviolence and non-cooperation also inspired other civil rights movements and figures around the world including the Dalai Lama and Nelson Mandela. History has proven over and over again in all these examples that nonviolent approaches for causes are indeed successful. The main reason for its success is because it is so passive but so powerful that it prevents any line of justification for attack by the opponent. One cannot ethically nor morally justify oppressing a man who did no harm to them. This is why the nonviolent movement is so unique. It is why it is the only movement or method of protest that is able to unite all people alike, frail or strong, young or old, black or white, poor or rich. One need not need a military vest or carry a weapon. You can simply wear a dhoti and carry a thin bamboo stick. Mahatma Gandhi showed us that it is the only power one needs to fight in a nonviolent movement is to believe in your principles, know your rights, and have a strong moral resolve. The impact of and the potential for nonviolent movements hits back so close to home, to our present days. I believe that using Gandhi's Satyagraha movement as a model for pre prevention of violence and nonviolence in the racial justice movements across our country and the world right now is key to ensuring peace and harmony in those protests. We, ha we all have now seen George Floyd's death and how it evoked global outrage and protest to end violence, injustice, and inequality. Reversing these actions with nonviolent actions indeed requires decisive social and policy reform. But we also have the privilege that Mahatma Gandhi did not have in the early 1900s, that is a voice in a democracy. 
the ability to make appropriate and civil changes. This privilege includes the freedom of speech and the freedom of expression. This privilege includes not only the freedom of speech and freedom of expression, but also freedom of media. In a set of rules for his fellow Satyagrahis, Mahatma Gandhi lists knowing your rights and freedoms as a major part of the nonviolent movement. Accordingly, if society, social programs, and government agencies further more education of one's basic rights as granted by the Bill of Rights of the Constitution, the police and counter scenario for many black Americans and minority communities would be less hostile as far too often does an understandably frightened black American or a minority stopped by the police react anxiously in fear that results in dangerous and unfortunately fatal mishaps. Educational reform might include teaching black Americans their own constitutional rights, how to stay calm, and how to avoid any fatal encounters. This inherent anxiety when the police stops a black American or a member of a marginalized community is the effect of decades long systemic discrimination in the 1900s. In order for more trust and social cohesion to be built between disparagingly affected communities and the police, social capital must be rebuilt. And that takes time and a long, good record. Mahatma Gandhi wrote that power is of two kinds. One is obtained by the fear of punishment and the other by acts of love. Power based on love is a thousand times more effective and permanent than the one derived from fear and punishment. It is exactly why we and the legislature need to work to remove the us versus them mindset. That latter mindset in most cases is unknowingly enforced by police departments becoming increasingly militarized. Though this may be necessary to combat, ex combat extreme and senseless violence, militarization of the police becomes a concern when excessive force, use of force is used in situation, situations in which it's not warranted. Such looks look intimidating to protesters, spooling preventable violence. The rationale behind this increasing militarization of the police force is often justified by pointing out the rooting and rioting and looting that sometimes occurs alongside a protest by bad apples. That is why police reform is as equally important as disowning those bad apples that tarnish the motives of a noble cause. According to Gandhi, nonviolence is the greatest force at the disposal of mankind. It is mightier than the mightiest weapon of destruction devised by the ingenuity of man. And so the question is, why don't we use it? Mahatma Gandhi and history proved it could work. Whatever the future again holds, again quoting Mahatma Gandhi, we must not lose faith in humanity. Humanity is like an ocean. A few drops of the ocean is dirty. The ocean does not become dirty in and of itself. End quote. If we follow Gandhi's words of peace and legacy of nonviolence, injustice and inequality in our present society can be smoothly and all but eradicated. Our enemy is violence, and violence is our enemy. The injustice against any person or what any group is never forgotten. They, by the nation's subsequent response, and our de demands are instead always forgotten. Thank you.